Luminary presents Therapy versus the World. I'm your host, Joe Nucci, and today it is just going to be you and me, and I'm going to teach you all about psychoanalysis through the Disney movie Moana. When I first saw this movie years ago, it immediately became one of my favorites, and it became one of my favorites because I saw it, I finished it, and I immediately watched it again because I couldn't believe how skillful the storytellers at Disney were in terms of telling a very universal archetypal story about psychological development. The, the symbolism, the lyrics they used in their songs, there was so much there that related to my field and passion, psychotherapy. So for those of you who haven't seen it, Moana is a Disney movie about a girl named Moana who grows up on an island. And when she's young, she feels this pull to go explore the ocean. And so right from the beginning, you have land, islands, and you have the ocean. And when the grandmother is telling the stories about the different creatures in the ocean, she makes the ocean seem like it's a it's a dark and unknown place. And for me, that is because the ocean is symbolic of your unconscious. Your unconscious, psychologically speaking, is, is everything that's unknown to you. And things that are, that are unknown can be, can be scary, and for good reason. The island, the land masses that the different sailors sail to, those, that's, that's what they know. And that's all that Moana knows growing up. She's never been beyond the reef. And so one of the ways to understand the human mind, according to Freud, is to separate it how, between the consciousness this is everything that you know, and the unconscious. And so in Disney's Moana, it's the island is everything she knows. It's everything she has ever been exposed to. And then there's also the unconscious, everything beyond the reef. In traditional psychoanalytic theory, there's also something called the pre-conscious. And I kind of like to think of that as the, the part of the ocean that Moana sails in that is neither the reef right, nor the island and pre-consciousness is, is things that you're aware of that you can access in your unconscious with very little prompting, but there's no defenses. There's nothing actually stopping you from, from going out there. The story of Moana, very symbolically explained, could be explained as the story of a young woman who goes and explores the ocean, explores her unconsciousness. And as she does that, she actually matures into an adult. And that's that's exactly how psychotherapy and psychoanalysis works. You sit down in front of your therapist and you say, oh, well, I'm going to free associate, I'm going to riff, I'm going to kind of make things up about my past and give words to different experiences I have, and I'm going to see if they stick, and I'm going to see how they feel. And as you do that, as you explore your unconscious, that's one of the ways that you grow. And one of the things that is very terrifying about that experience is that your unconscious can be a very, very scary place. So for an example, one of the things that we'll talk about today is this idea of the shadow. This is the parts of your mind that you don't like to think about because they're against your morals, because you don't like to think that you're capable of, of different things that you find immoral or, or unethical. But I operate from the assumption that you know, growing up, human beings are not good or bad. They're a they're a mix of both. And when you explore yourself, when you gain a lot of self-awareness, when you do a lot of self-reflecting, sometimes you encounter things about yourself that you don't like or that you find distasteful. And one of the tricky parts about facilitating psychoanalysis, just like one of the tricky parts about Moana exploring the ocean throughout the duration of the movie, is that Sometimes she encountered things that were very, very challenging. And that is, that is what psychoanalysis is like. People don't refer to therapy as work because it's always fun and it's about making you feel good. But I, 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 I don't know. I, I think that's just such a, a brilliant way that the, the filmmakers set that up, that dichotomy between everything she knows and everything she doesn't know. And this dynamic is really, really pronounced when you think about the relationship between her and her father and her grandmother. When Freud understood the mind, he understood it as an interplay between the id, the superego, and the ego. Now, Mo Moana is a child, as a baby, 
She's always running out to the ocean. She represents the id, and the id is the part of the mind that's all instinct and all impulse. And you know Moana represents the id because she's a baby who cannot swim, and she wants to go explore the sea. <laughs> that's all impulse. That's all desire. That's all passion. And that's and that's part of her, and that's, and that's deep in her. Anyone who has ever um, treated children or adolescents or worked with them knows that they are, they are just like that, you know? And going back to what I said earlier, not all, not all parts of yourself are necessarily good or adaptive. And by adaptive, I mean, um, leading to social harmony with others and helping you bring you to your goals. And children are, you know, unbelievably impulsive. And one of the things that children need, they need parents, they need guardians, and they need someone to kind of temper their id. They need to kind of temper those impulses. And that's exactly what Moana's father tries to do. He really discourages her from ever going out onto the, onto the, on, um, beyond the reef and to sail into the ocean. And the, the father represents the, the superego. And this is the the part of your mind that acts as a kind of critical self-consciousness that you inherit from your family, from society, and from culture, and from laws and norms. Because culture, people teach you that if you don't behave in a somewhat civilized way, that people aren't going to want to hang out with you. And you learn that when you're a little kid. You learn that if you take toys from other people, that even if it feels good, even if that's what your id wants, if that's the impulse, you learn very, very quickly that people aren't going to want to be your friend. And that'll that'll make you feel sad and feel and feel shame but in this instance feeling sad and shame is not a a thing to be processed out in therapy it's it's adaptive it's actually f- helping you achieve social harmony with others and so the the superego and the id are not necessarily good or bad but they're they're in conflict with each other because we have these these impulses these emotions these passions the id this is moana as a child and then we also have society kind of taming us in a certain way. And that's represented by Moana's father. You know, she wants to sail. She wants to go explore the unknown. He doesn't want her to because she's not ready yet. Now, the third part of the mind that Freud talks about is something called the ego. And the ego has a lot of different, what might I call it, different definitions depending on who you ask. But according to Freud, the ego is the part of the mind that kind of mediated the relationship between the id and the superego. And in the movie, you see the grandma is constantly doing this. She's constantly encouraging Moana. And she says things like, you know, in one of the songs, she says, you are your father's daughter, stubbornness and pride, but listen to that voice inside you. And she says, that voice shows you who you are. And the moment she says that, she's kind of lifting up these palm leaves and she's showing Moana a sailboat. She goes, this is really who you are. And then and then the dad catches them. <laughs> and the dad looks at the grandma with such disdain, you know, and as many parents probably do to the to the to the meddling grandparents. But what was what was so brilliant about that, psychologically speaking, is that face he makes, that's exactly how the super ego feels about the ego. Because the superego doesn't like that the ego is sometimes okay with the id. You know, the superego would much prefer to take total control. And at the same time, Mo- Moana's grandmother, you know, she she takes the heart of Tafiti, this um, little jewel that the ocean gives Moana when she's a, she's a baby. This is what calls her to the ocean, calls her to explore. And she actually saves it for her until she's ready because the grandma knows that Moana's not ready till she's ready. And... Um, Growing up, you know, childhood and adolescent development, it's a very, um, it's a very precocious process and they're not ready to do things until they're ready. And developmentally speaking, that can look like different ages for different people. Some children are going to, for example, develop sexually quite early. Um, the id is full of sexual and erotic energy. Um, and it may be it may be appropriate for them to have their first boyfriend or girlfriend or what have you as a teenager. Others you know, won't hit puberty until later and they're not gonna be ready for a sexual relationship until much later. And so it's the ego, the part of the mind that mediates between those impulses and what society expects from us. and allows for there to be a little bit of room there. So when, when Moana is a little kid and she's all id, um, there's this song that the father sings to her. The song is called Where You Are. And he basically says, you don't need anything out there 
in the ocean. Everything you need is right here on this island. Um, we have coconuts, we have fish, you know, we have family. Um, and so the, the village and oh, you see all the villagers dancing and they, and they represent the family structure, um, which kind of traditionalizes the demands of, of the superego. Tradition and structure get handed down through generations and the way we raise our children are often through those traditions. You know, even if our modern day sensibilities say that, you know, this is outdated, um, you know, there, there, there is still needs to be a way that you kind of socialize children and kind of like bring them in. And so, you know, one of the things that comes up for me is something like, um, you know, like, uh, like school dances you know, at least in America, are very normative and common. That's one of the ways society safely allows, you know, boys and girls or boys and boys and girls and girls, depending on, you know, who you're attracted to, to kind of start to, to regulate their impulses, to regulate their id in that way. Um, the, 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 the song Where You Are in the movie opens with this lyric. It's, it's, Time you knew the village is all you need. And, and that's exactly how the superego feels because the demands of society, you let them have their way, would just totally squash all kind of individual expression. And societies that are, you know, highly homogenous and highly authoritarian, um, they're run very efficiently, you know, to to that point, like, you know, that this isn't me, you know, I'm not pro authoritarianism or anything like that, but it's, if the super ego had its way and if the super ego were to be manifested, I think it would be manifested in something like an authoritarian society. The id would be anarchy. The id would be, well, you just do what feels good whenever you want it. And throughout the song, it's really, really cute because Moana keeps, she's, you know, this little kid, she keeps running back to the ocean. She wants to break outside of the family structure. And um, anyone who has spent any time with children knows that this is so obviously a perfect description of exactly how children act, um, particularly as teenagers too. You know, teenagers go through this process called individuation where they they rebel and it's so they can feel like an individual, you know? And so no matter what your parenting style is for any parents or teenagers listening to this, no matter what your parenting style is, that rebellion, that testing of boundaries is um, not just normal, but I would actually argue developmentally it's important. And it can look differently depending on um, the culture of the family, the broader culture, the personality of the teenager, but there is still this undeniable pull towards the ocean, towards exploring different parts of yourself. Um, that's a very universal human experience. And um, there's this other lyric in the song, you know, it's, he says, who needs a new song? The old one's all we need. And so again, it's this reinforcement of the super ego reimposing that family structure on Moana and Moana as a, as a child, she kind of represents the id. Um, other lyrics, you know, this tradition is our mission. Again, it's the same exact thing. When you raise a child, that's exactly the message you give to them. It's not developmentally appropriate to tell a child that, you know, well, your family will provide for a lot of needs, but one day you're going to grow up and, you know, you're not going to want to be with your family anymore. In fact, nothing will embarrass you more. You don't, you don't have that conversation with a little kid that that's too confusing. They don't have the cognitive capacities for that nuance yet. You know, from the time we were born to the time that we die, we're bombarded with information. And when we're young, when we're children, our brains aren't fully developed yet. And so the information that we take in, it's a little bit more simplified. So uh, a child might refer to a uh, a four-legged animal with a tail and a nose as a dog, even though the child might be looking at a pig or a cow um, because it, it, it doesn't have the capacity to handle all of that nuance and to kind of organize all the information coming in that slowly starts to happen as the child gets older. So Moana grows up and, and, and in the song, she even, there's this moment where she, she puts on her, you know, chief, um, or kind of like empress kind of like um, headdress. And she goes, you know, there's the sense of like, she can be happy. She can be happy just being here. But even as she's walking on the ceremony, she kind of looks and her, her grandma, that's the ego. Remember her grandma's dancing, you know, by the ocean. And that's the, because the ego is keeping that super ego in check. The ego knows that the super ego is important for a while, but it can't, it, it can't get too full of itself, you know? And so she actually goes and joins the grandmother and they're, they're dancing on the water. And the grandmother actually says, you know, follow that voice inside, follow your impulse and instinct, Moana, which is not what the super ego likes, as I said. The grandma has this lyric where she goes, you know, the village may think I'm crazy or say that I've drifted too far. 
And that's exactly what the superego thinks of the ego. Because it, it just it just can't understand why it would have any sympathies towards the id. Because as far as the superego is concerned, the id only causes problems. You know, but you know, I brought up you know authoritarian societies earlier. Too much superego causes problems too. And it's not just that problems you see in therapy have to do with, you know, poor impulse control and lack of insight. A lot of people come to therapy and they're incredibly rigid in their ways. And, and one of the reasons why the superego needs the id is because if you don't grow, if you don't change, if you don't go and explore your unconscious and see what other ways you can be, what other ways you can manifest in the world, you'll die on the vine. And that that's very, very clear when you look at, you know, really, and I, I mean this psychologically, like psychologically conservative cultures and, and people, they, they don't adapt with the times, they don't change. And it absolutely devastates them mentally. Um, people that are wired like that, people like that are, the psychologists call them neophobic. They don't like novelty. Um, and whether you're neophobic or neophilic, you're really drawn to novelty. That um, personality trait is one way to think about it. It's actually like on a bell curve. And people that are very variety seeking. I'm one of those people. And let me tell you, it is, it is not um, just a positive trait because I will find myself, you know, going on dates, exposing myself to friendships and people and ideas that aren't necessarily good for me. They, they're not necessarily serving me where I want to go. But the opposite is also true. If you never expose yourself to anything new, that can also cause you a, quite a few problems. Moana you know, is motivated to go and explore her unconscious. And this is where the id is, is, a, is on your side. You know, the, the, the id, those, that impulse to go explore, to go beyond the reef. Because she says there's this one point she takes the sailboat out um, without her father's permission and she goes to explore, you know, beyond the reef. And she gets absolutely smacked by a wave. She gets washed up on shore and the boat is wrecked. And then who's there? The ego. There's grandma. And grandma is like... <laughs> what are you doing? He goes, you don't know enough yet. And then the grandma tells her stories to help, to help her grow. She tells her stories about her, her people to give her the, the, the confidence to go and to go and sail. And, 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 and that's the thing you can't, you can't do analytical work, you know, without a strong ego. We, uh, psychologists, we call this kind of like ego strength. Um, there, the, if, if the ego is, is, is too weak, it can get, um, well, and get overwhelmed by material in the unconscious and get smacked down by a wave. Um, or it may not be able to stand up to the demands of the super ego, right? Or the demands of the id. Um, and so a, a strong ego is very, very important when it comes to doing analytical work. Journey that Moana goes through as she becomes braver. There's this one scene where she, you know, she, she stands up to her father and she goes, I don't want to go very far out into the ocean. She goes, just beyond the reef, you know, and he goes, no. And the way he frowns at her, just like how he frowned at the, at the grandma, like the super ego does not like that. And um, she's really, really upset. And there's this scene where her um, mother comes to comfort her. And the mother brings up this idea of, of trauma. When I say trauma in this instance, I'm speaking about trauma very, very broadly. I'm not talking about PTSD, although I do think that the father's character has PTSD in this movie um, because she she tells him the story about how he tried to sail before he was ready and then his friend ended up drowning and so the father is is so stern with her because he just doesn't want you know the same thing to happen and and this is very classic you know kind of uh adolescent and parent conflict because adolescents just they just want to live their lives man like it's like oh my god my mom is such a control freak dude my my parents all oh, they just don't they just don't get it <laughs> and um and that's and that's exactly how a lot of teenagers um can feel particularly if they're um if they're um raised by you know a kind of more like a, a authoritative um parents parents who aren't very permissive but if you if you actually work with children who grew up in a household um, where they're the parents were very permissive they often resent their parents for that they resent their parents because they got themselves into trouble they didn't develop discipline and so again these things aren't good or bad it's all about balance it's all about doing them in a way to help you be adaptive the mom tells this story and you know she says you know he couldn't save him referring to his dad's friend he's hoping he can save you from a family therapy perspective, you know, this, this kind of trauma is, um, it's almost intergenerational. So a trauma response occurs when something unimaginable happens to you. The dad couldn't imagine that his friend would die when he went out onto the boat. 
And um, when a trauma happens to you, um, when that psychogenic event happens to you, what basically happens is that your mind reorganizes itself in a way to make sense for that event. And the what the mind often does is it often starts to come up with beliefs about control. So I think it's perfectly fitting that the the father is symbolic of the superego because the superego is, is about control, it's about rigidity. And the one of the beliefs could be, well, if we never sail beyond the reef, nothing bad will happen to us. You know, and in the father's defense, you know, that actually makes sense. So for an example, if someone gets into a car accident, right, they might develop a phobia of traveling in vehicles or or maybe they develop agoraphobia. They don't want to leave their house. Well, in your mind's defense, never leaving your house is a great way to guarantee you never get into a car accident again. And that's something you see very common with survivors of, of trauma. And one of the, the difficult things you see in family therapy with intergenerational um, trauma is you'll see those trauma responses kind of get passed on through rules and through beliefs. And one of the things a therapist might do with you is they might say, oh, well, let's actually take that apart a little bit you know, how does it make sense, you know, that your, your grandmother had this belief about this and that affected your mom or dad or that affected you, et cetera. Oftentimes the, the, the trauma responses people have make sense for a while. So it actually, while there's fish in the reef and the darkness isn't here yet and the island can sustain itself, the rule actually makes sense. We don't have to go beyond the reef you know, because the risk isn't worth the reward. But what often makes a trauma response maladaptive is it starts outliving its usefulness. So one, you know, one very common trauma response, if you're a, um, let's say a survivor of sexual assault, let's say a very, very common trauma response is, well, if I don't date, if I don't put myself in situations where I can be harassed or groped or any of those things, then I will be safe. And that is true. You know, technically, you know, if you, I mean, if you're a, let's say if you're a, a woman, if you never go on a date with a man and you never go anywhere without your girlfriends, um, you know, that that is true. But if, if that belief is so extreme that one day you wake up and you're, you know, in your thirties or forties and you have no relationship experience and you walk into therapy, your therapist, I would have a ton of empathy for why you made the decision that you made. But I would also understand that your belief about safety is a maladaptive trauma response. It's no longer serving you. It may have made sense, you know, in the months following the assault, you know, while you were still learning to calm down your nervous system, but it became this full-fledged belief. And you see something similar happening with, with Moana's dad. Another example of this, you know, maybe you have a parent that uh, parties too much when they're younger. And so, so their kids aren't going to mess with any of that. And, it is, and there's a benefit to that, you know, but if your kid never, you know, if you don't teach your kid how to drink responsibly, if you don't teach them how to conduct themselves in a crowded room full of people, that's actually not going to set them up for success. That's not very adaptive. And so Moana's mom leaves her and um, my favorite song of the whole, of the whole movie is, you know, how far I'll go. And this song is a, it's a beautiful representation of, of individuation in adolescence. I talked about this earlier, this process in which adolescents feel separate from their parents and that it can be very painful for parents and children. I, I don't think that's acknowledged, you know, societally quite enough because, because uh, if you're a parent, you know, when, when that little kid is born, when, when Moana's little and, you know, they're, they're running towards danger and you're saving them from, from the predators, you know, that are out there and from their, from their own worst impulses, you know, you, you teach this, you know, little kid little kid, this, this little mini you, how to walk and talk and, and all these things. And your reward, if you do a good job for that, your reward is that they will talk back to you and they will walk away from you. And isn't that like, and, and I don't think people talk about how, how difficult that is for, for, for teenagers, number one, because that's very difficult to stand up. And some teenagers don't, you know, and I've had those in my office too, you know, the ones still living in the basement. That is not like, in my opinion, those parents did not do a good job. You know, at least not by the the cultural Western standards that I practice in, right? And but it's also incredibly painful for the parents. I mean, to to be a mother, you know, and to to be born with the mom brain, you know, and and protect this little infant, and then your reward is one day they won't need you anymore. I mean, I think I think that's very painful. And so um, the song "How Far I'll Go" 
is, you know, Moana expresses at the beginning of the song this like deep sense of restlessness and a desire to explore the ocean. Um, and no matter how hard she tries, right, she can't do what her parents are expecting of her because her parents are like, stay here, you know, <laughs> stay with us in this island. Do not go out there, you know. And and and, and psychologically speaking, that's um, that's not optimal. That's not optimal for in, in, for individuation. Sometimes people come into therapy, you know, and they. You almost can't tell the difference between their beliefs and morals and their families. And it's not so, and, and a lot of people share beliefs and morals with their families. That's not what I'm pointing to. When, when I speak about this term, it's called a meshment. When I speak about a meshment, it's that the boundaries are so blurred that it's not that the person as a conscious adult chose this moral value that was passed down from their parents. It's that they inherited it and they never took a step out of it to understand its value and go back in. And that's why individuation is so important. Um, I, I believe it's um, certain Mormon cultures, subcultures do this, where they actually let the child go. And if the child comes back, if they choose it, then they're in the religion, you know, quite wholeheartedly. And so there's actually something very psychologically wise, I think, about doing that. Um, there's this... Uh, <laughs> there's this joke where you know it says if you love someone let them go if you come if they come back they're yours forever but there's this lesser known joke where if you love someone let them go and if they they don't come back like you go fight for them <laughs> you know and so but that's and but there's something you know about the parents and adolescent relationship that's actually very analogous to that because i think that you know uh, the one of the tricky things about parenting teenagers is you do let them go you give them the driver's license you let them stay out all night but if they can't handle it, if they're not ready to sail beyond the reef, you go and you grab them back in, you know, until they're ready. And that's one of the things that parents have to do. And so anyways, she's, she's, she's singing this song. As the song progresses, she, you know, starts to confront the different obstacles and challenges that, you know, stand in her way. She grapples with feelings of self-doubt and uncertainty. Because like I said, it's very scary to stand up to your parents, to go through that process of individuation. And, you know, she's even tempted to give up on her quest at one point in the song to, to just stay in the safety and the familiarity. But at the end of the song, she, you know, she embraces it. Um, and it's actually after that song that the, the wave smacks her down. And that's when the grandmother, the ego, comes in and tells her stories about her, her people. At one point in the movie, you know, the, the, the grandma actually falls ill and the grandma, the ego, this is when Moana's character starts to, you know, um, at least momentarily, she kind of takes on this character of the, of the ego. And Moana's grandmother says to her, she goes, you go and you find this character called Maui and you restore the heart of Tafiti. When you restore the heart, the darkness won't be infecting the island anymore. And so... She goes, she, she, she sets sail and she sets sail with this, with this pig and this rooster <laughs> or this chicken who are just the most worthless companions. And, but that's, but that's how your companions are when you're an adolescent, you know, when you, when you start developing or not even just when you're an adolescent, I think when you're in a, when you're a young adult, you know, a lot of people in their twenties, they, they go into therapy and they're talking to their friends about therapy and their journey. And you, you listen to what they say, you know, with the wisdom of an older person or the experience and training of a therapist. And you just think to yourself, oh my gosh, you're so lost. <laughs> you know, you really are. It kind of reminds me of, um, um, because this is a theme that that Disney does all the time. I mean, in in Hercules, you know, his his uh, his companion is that that little goat, you know. Um, or in the Lion King, it's like Pumbaa and Timon who just Hakuna Matata. Like you just want to eat and feel good all day, you know. And that's because the the adolescent, the ego, hasn't learned to tame the id yet, you know. And so there's still a lot of kind of psychological conflict, you know, there. But the uh, so she she sets sail with the best she's got, which is which is not a lot of you know anything, and she she visits Maui. So she sets sail to find Maui, and um, she kind of yells at the ocean. She yells at her unconscious, and she says, you know, she's like, she's like, what? Like you tipped over my boat, you know? Like how could you? You know, can, can I get a little help here? And then a storm comes, you know, and the storm actually ends up washing her onto the shore where, where, where Maui is. But I think the storm for me represents two things. The first thing is that it represents something called post-traumatic growth. Um, not all traumas leave a, a psychogenic scar. Not all, And this is why not everything bad that happens to you, I think, is fairly characterized as a trauma, by the way, because some bad things that happen to you actually push you in a direction that you need to go. You know, it actually gives you an adaptive pattern. 
post-traumatic growth refers to the resiliency that pe- and transformation that people feel after something bad that happens to them, after a trauma even. A, and a, I, I mean that technically. Um, but I also think it's it's kind of representative for this idea that you know you you encounter things you don't like in your unconscious and they in the process of psychoanalysis and and, and you think they're really disturbing but then they often end up becoming something that you embrace you know so for example some people don't like to be told that um that they're arrogant particularly men um Men don't like to be told that they're arrogant, but the, the thing about arrogance is where arrogance ends and confidence begins or competence, you know, it's all kind of, and sometimes you have to fake it till you make it. So that there's, there's aspects of arrogance that are also quite attractive, you know, as, 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 as well. So I'm, I'm thinking of a patient I had, they, he, he had a really hard time articulating that he was arrogant, but as soon as he did, there was all these developmental gifts that came along with his analysis. Then Moana meets the, the storm washes her up and she, she meets Maui. Maui is also kind of this, this figure of the, of the, of the ego. Um, but he's, I, I think he's better understood because he helps Moana. He helps Moana become a, a respectable adult. That's kind of what Maui does. He teaches her how to sail, teaches her how to kind of, you know, stand up for herself. Um, but I think, I think his character is better understood as the Jungian concept of, of the self. And the self represents like the totality of an individual psyche, all the unconsciousness, all the consciousness, all what's known, all what's unknown. Unconsciousness is the sea. The consciousness is the island. And, you know, I think, I think Maui is the representation of the self because not only does he serve as an ego figure to Moana, like he helps her become competent, but he also reflects like her total totality. Like he is also, you know, um, arrogant and impulsive, but he's also very structured and, and, and disciplined. He kind of represents both the, the dad and the grandmother in one character. And that makes sense because as soon as, as soon as Moana leaves the island, you know, she doesn't have those characters guiding her anymore. Moana meets Maui and she's, she's immediately dismayed because he's a demigod and he's supposed to be impressive, but, um, meeting herself, meeting a mirror like that in therapy, when people actually start to learn about the things they don't like about themselves, it's very distressing. It's very distressing to really look in the mirror and actually see what it is that's there, particularly the, the, the things that you don't like. The last thing I want to say about Maui is, you know, throughout her interactions with Maui, um, Moana comes to recognize her own inner power and embraces her own identity you know, as a leader and a hero of the own story with agency, with, with competency, with earned competency. Like she actually learns how to sail. So there's this part in the movie where there's this darkness and it's, and it's kind of coming on the island and it's making it so they, they're coconuts, they can't harvest their coconuts, they're not able to get fish. And that means that the village is, the village is in trouble. And um, I think that the darkness symbolically, it, uh, it represents something called shadow work that I alluded to earlier. It's the, it's the parts of your mind you don't want to work with. Um, shadow work is a Jungian term. And so this is kind of an addition to Freud's traditional conception of, of the mind. And, um, you know, I mentioned too, too much superego, too much rigidity, not enough growth, not enough self-reflection, not enough exploration of your unconscious. That can, that can cause a lot of problems. And you see that manifested in the movie, how the darkness is... Uh, what might I say? The darkness is taking away the village's ability to sustain itself. That's definitely what's happening psychologically when someone comes into therapy, particularly, you know, if they're, if they're too rigid or they're being too impulsive, if, if the ego isn't able to balance those two forces, they, um, they're probably not able to sustain whatever it is that they're doing. There's this one point where Moana has a dream of the shadow completely enveloping the island and, um, and that makes perfect sense to me because in traditional psychoanalysis, dream analysis can be very important if your patient remembers your dreams. And basically what one way you use dreams in psychoanalysis is you say, um, you look at the, the emotional content and themes of the dream and you, you, you help people dig in a little bit deeper. And so while Moana has this brave face and she is sailing the ocean, exploring her unconscious, symbolically speaking, growing, encountering monsters, um, when she sleeps and she dreams about how scary the darkness is and how dangerous this is, what she's doing to, to, 
to explore her unconsciousness in, in the way that she is, there's some real risk to that, you know? Um, and this is a, the, the ideas of excessive self-reflection um, carrying risk is something that psychoanalysts um, understood more recently than in the past. We, we used to think that people would just analyze and analyze and everything would be fine. But what we actually found was conducted improperly, you know, psychoanalysis can really harm you, you know? And that's why the ocean as a representative of the unconscious is so perfect because, you know, there was a chance she wouldn't make it, you know? And, and Disney doesn't really highlight that point, you know, super extremely because it is a Disney movie and it's rated PG. But, you know, for our conversation here, that's, that's exactly what's happening. The darkness came when Maui stole the heart of Tefiti, the, the mother island, you know, and there's this other kind of lava character, you know, Taka. And one of the ways they, they need to go confront this monster and restore Tefiti's heart is they actually have to go into the underworld. And this, is, this happens in a lot of Disney movies. This is a very common symbolic um, representation of, of shadow work, um, of kind of confronting the dragon. So Moana goes down into the other world and she, con she confronts this very interesting crab monster. That's essentially the dragon in King Arthur. That's what, it, that's what that is. That's, um, that's Simba confronting Scar. That's Hercules confronting Hades. And I think the reason why it's such an, the, the reason why it's such an archetypal story is that, you know, in order to really grow, in order to do that proper analytical work, you actually have to look at the scary things. You actually have to talk about the things that are really real and, in our day-to-day -day life, that's not very adaptive, right? Because you don't want to walk through the city and think about what a miracle it is that the plumbing is working and the electricity is running and and all the different ways something can go wrong. Um, people who come in with kind of that really uh, catastrophic existential anxiety of like how the world might end, they're actually paying too much attention to all those really serious things. But some people come into therapy and they need to be I need to be taught to confront those things. And so the, and, and sh the shadow work and going into the underworld is Moana's representation of that. And, and that can be really scary to actually confront those things. But one of, the, one of the healing aspects of therapy in that honest space where you can actually explore those things without judgment, that's what makes the, the therapy so beneficial. And it, it, it makes sense to me that the way the writers of the movie did it was that she has to go down into the underworld. She has to do some of the shadow work and confront those things before she can go and confront the lava monster and, and restore the heart. And, and I, and I think that, I think that the reason why that's true is because she, she goes down and she actually gets, um, she gets Maui's fish hook you know, she, she, she needs skills, she needs tools. And, and that's exactly what you need in order to grow and in order to succeed in life. And that's why so much of psychoanalysis is not just properly executed. It's actually analyzing and then using those insights to actually give people skills and tools so they can grow, so, so they can integrate that new awareness. I think one of the, you know, the really brilliant things that they did, the lava monster, Taka and Tefiti, is Moana realizes that they're actually the same character. She actually, she actually discovers that, oh my gosh, that really like scary thing is actually also the really good thing. It was just missing this piece. And it was such a, it was such a beautiful symbolic representation of what we would call integration. Um, and so the, the idea of integration is a very old one in psychotherapy. Basically the idea is that, you know, in order to mature, you don't pretend these dark parts of yourself don't exist. You actually embrace them. And so, for example, someone might think, um, well, I'm completely harmless. I'm such a good person. <laughs> yeah. Anyone with any life experience at all knows they meet someone like that and that they need to run because that person is going to leave chaos in their way because that person is harming people and they don't have the maturity. They haven't developed. They haven't looked into their unconscious deeply enough to understand that like, oh, but I could hurt someone. And, and this isn't to say that everyone is, you know, like a, a sociopathic evil monster. That's, the, that's, the, that, that's not the point here. It's when, when you hurt people, it's not always with intention, you know, but everyone here, everyone listening to this has hurt someone before, you know, maybe not physically, but emotionally guaranteed. And so I thought it was this really beautiful moment where Moana is kind of like walking through the sea. She literally, like the, the water split. So she's literally walking through her unconscious with all the tools and experiences she gained 
you know, with the movie. And when she she does that, she she gives the monstrous part of herself. She gives it a heart. She gives it a little bit of love. And uh, the way this manifests in, in in psychotherapy, I really like to to do this with parts work. Um, so you you talk about this part of yourself. Let's say um, let's say you're someone that gets really emotionally activated in a fight with your significant other, and you get you get so sensitive, and you don't like being sensitive. You know, the way you regulate your sensitivity is to not stuff the tears down necessarily. In therapy, you actually say, okay, well, what if this sensitive part of yourself, what if we actually didn't try to fight it and try to make it wrong? What if we actually gave it a little hug? What if we embraced it? You know, what are the positives of this part of yourself? You know, where did this part of yourself come from? How does it make sense that you developed this part of yourself? And it is typically, you know, one of the old adages of therapy, the way forward is through. And so when when people do that, you know, a lot of the time they're actually able to to grow in the way they want. They're actually ironically able to not let their sensitivities overwhelm them. And that's that's what you see Moana do when she gives to Ka the heart of Tafiti, and you realize they're the same thing. Uh, one of the laws of personality psychology, it's Funder's first law. It's that there is no weakness without a strength, and there is no advantage without a disadvantage. So if you think about somebody who is um who's charismatic. You might think to yourself, well, what could possibly be wrong with being charismatic? Well, I treated some charismatic people, and one of the things they really struggle with is people agree with them and, and their advice and their decisions, even though they don't have much to stand on. And so the charisma can sometimes become a crutch. You know, they didn't they don't necessarily earn the authority that's given to them, you know, but they still have that power anyways. You know, or you could say, um, Someone who's very disagreeable. Well, what could possibly be good about be good about being disagreeable? Disagreeable people get paid way more than agreeable people, you know? <laughs> and they often they often get what they want. Now, are they as popular and as well liked socially as agreeable people? No, you know. But again, it's it's that weakness with the strength in the process of ego development. You know, the way the ego balances the super ego, the id, the self. The way it balances all these things is it takes the good with the bad. You know, and that's exactly what the grandma does throughout the movie. You know, and there's this really sweet moment where she actually, the spirit of the grandmother actually embraces Moana. And then she's able to go and integrate. She's able to go and battle Taka and then realize that Taka wasn't even the, wasn't even who it should be battling. And Taka was actually is the Tafiti who needs the heart. Um, and so she comes back a fully integrated uh, human being. And the darkness is gone, but it's not gone. It's it's integrated, you know, from a psychological perspective. And with that, with her, with her maturation, with her development, um, everyone is ready to sail. Even her father, you know, because the, the the super ego knows knows its place now. And you know, the final song is you know it's this it's this voyage to the next islands. And I think that this is a beautiful symbol for this process that I've described for you today, it's this constant process of self-transformation. You know, maybe you go in and out of therapy through your lifetime. Maybe you, maybe you have a coach, maybe a very supportive partner. However it is that you engage in the process of transformation, it is cyclical. And so Moana kind of goes into her unconscious and she comes out of it and it's integrated and she goes in and she comes out. And where I think a lot of people get into trouble is they, they don't embrace the cyclical nature of self-work. They, they, they want to keep on analyzing. They want to dig, 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 and they go all the way down into the depths. And then they don't even know which way is up, you know, because they're in the abyss. But um, the, the, the good way to do it is you go in deep enough based on your, your skills. You go deep enough to the extent that your skills and self-awareness will allow you to go. And then you kind of come back up from air. You, you come back up to the island. And you don't necessarily need to be transforming all the time. But the transition from childhood to adolescence to adulthood, those are times where this process definitely shines forth. Maybe when you get married, maybe when you become a parent, maybe when you lose a parent, you know, you have to kind of constantly go in and, and reinvent themselves or reinvent yourself. And um, by the end of the movie, Moana has done her work and she's now able to engage in a lifelong process of self-transformation. And um, her consciousness, the village, is better off for it. You know, it's not, it's no longer divided and, and pitted against with the unconscious, you know, and this is, this is how the, my understanding, this is how the Polynesian people, um, 
existed. They would sail from island to island, you know, and they would let resources replenish and, and, and things like that. That's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed my psychological interpretation of Disney's Moana. And I hope that you learned something about yourself, about others, about the process of psychological development. And if you want to learn other things, particularly through this new solo format that I'm going to sprinkle in this season, consider subscribing to Therapy Versus the World only on Luminary.